Noah Gift is the founder of Pragmatic AI Labs. He lectures on cloud computing at top universities globally, including Duke and Northwestern. Graduate data science programs, he designs graduate machine learning. MLOps AI and data science courses. In his free time, he consults on machine learning and cloud architecture for AWS and is a massive advocate of AWS machine learning and putting machine learning models into production. Oh yeah, by the way, Noah has offered several books, including Practical ML Ops, Pragmatic AI, Python for DevOps, and Cloud Computing. For data analysts, last time he has created content around AWS for top course providers, including Udacity, O'Reilly, and Pearson. You can find many AWS examples from Noah by following him on LinkedIn. Oh yeah, and by the way, he gives some great career advice all day. Noah, it's great to have you on the MLOps community meetup. Thanks for joining us today. There you go, man. Welcome to cool. the community meetup. It is a blast to have you here. And I can see people throwing things in the chat. Hopefully that intro did you a favor, not a disfavor, and you uh, appreciated it. Yeah, no, I, like I said, it, 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 in the chat, it kind of a little bit reminds me there. I, I forget who did it, but there was like a, somebody did like a, a folk song of every like actual things Alex Jones said. And it was like this kind of like kind of peaceful folk song. And these are listening to the lyrics and you're like, whoa, this is this is a really disturbed person. But it's kind of like it's amazing if you read text, it can go, it, it it's it's an interesting um kind of uh contrast of just reading something and then singing. So yeah, yep. sounds sounds great. You get to throw in your own accents to the words and all that good stuff. Well, man, it's great to have you here. I know you've got a presentation and a lot to go over for us. Um, or you've got some some things to teach us today about AWS and all that good stuff and what we can learn. Well, not just AWS. I think you've got more than that. I'll stop talking now and let you take over. Sure. And yeah, get let, your... let me just... Um... Uh, pull things screen. up yeah. yeah so let's go here we'll take off my singer songwriter hat in the meantime <laughs> and put on my glasses so i can so i can be in my learning phase now and this. if anyone has questions while we are hearing this from noah feel free to throw it in the chat or in the uh, questions answers and if there is a moment that is free i'll stop noah and ask him and then we can get rocking and rolling again cool so no it's all yeah. you man yeah so so i'll just briefly talk about mlops zero to one and in a nutshell here a little bit of my background you already heard i've had some experience in film written some books worked on social media currently uh written uh a book called practical mlops and so today we're going to talk about why MLOps, 
do a little bit of a coding walkthrough, do some use case of, of MLOps, and then some Q&A. So first use case here for MLOps, I'm assuming many of you probably already know this, but let's go through it anyway. Like, why do we need MLOps and what is it? Uh, let's start with that. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting is that really it's operationalizing your model, right? So getting it into production so it can actually, you can actually do something with it. And I, I think there's a definitely a missing sense of urgency where we, we don't have enough of a, a sense of urgency to solve problems. And that's really why I think the world needs MLOps, like uh, solving drug discovery, uh, curing cancer, uh, you know, working on things that help humanity. I think those are reasons for MLOps. I think COVID-19 as well really revealed the need for this. I mean, we have still a huge pandemic and it reveals like there's all these other uh, diseases out there. What if we could use MLOps technologies, uh, MLOps methodologies, and actually just start permanently coming up with vaccines that solve uh, these, these diseases? I think that would be a, a, you know incredible. And then how do you get started with MLOps? We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, I think it's really taking a toy project and operationalizing it using continuous integration, continuous delivery, and then in terms of major ML ops platforms, uh, I'll talk about some of the cloud platforms in particular, like AWS SageMaker. Okay, so you know where are things headed? When I first wrote the book, Practical ML Ops, I had a lot of experience just in seeing what was happening in industry the last five years in teaching at all these different schools, teaching at UC Davis in the Bay Area. I taught in downtown San Francisco. You know, we worked with like Twitter, LinkedIn, all these companies over there. And then as I've moved over to the East Coast and, and worked with Duke, one of the things I've realized is that cloud computing is just not stopping. And, and, th and this was, I think, Q4 2020 on LinkedIn, I saw there was 200,000 jobs in cloud. But there, there was an article today in Wall Street Journal where they talked about how there's like 800,000 jobs now <laughs> in, in cloud computing. So it's not going away. And and also, AWS is probably the 800-pound gorilla of cloud. Azure is less uh, of, a, of a player, but still pretty big. And then GCP is definitely more of a niche player in, in the cloud. Also, we see data engineer is massively rising. And you know, I might do something in the future, maybe write a book on that coming up. And machine learning engineer as well, massively uh, huge topic. Data science itself, I really am short on it. It just has the job title. I think the methodology is great. It, and, I, and I think of data science a little bit like doing bench press, where they're, they're in the NFL, there's something called the NFL combine where you can uh, you get tested for how many times you can bench press 225. In theory, you would think, you know, especially like really big NFL players that the more you bench press, the better you're going to be in, in, in the NFL. It turns out it's just not really that correlated, right? It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't hurt, right? I mean, sure, if you're super strong and you can bench press 225 a bunch of times, which, you know, a lot of players are probably 225, that's great, but it's just a capability. It's not necessarily going to correspond. So I think data science to me feels a lot like bench press. Like, hey, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have a behavior, but is it really a job title. And I think that's where we're, we're seeing that it's more of something you should have in your toolkit, but not necessarily a job title. At least that's my opinion. Okay. So, you know, now that we know where things are headed, how do you, how do you get there? And I think part of it is with DevOps and MLOps. And in particular, you can see this foundational component here. DevOps really is the, the piece that I think many organizations just don't have the capabilities. And I see this with uh, really academic focused people who have spent a lot of time with uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch and a lot of this deep learning and they're writing equations on the board. That's great. You know, I mean, obviously really helpful to have deep understanding, understand calculus, understand, you know, how derivatives work, how to do gradient descent, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can't automate your code and you have no testing, it really doesn't matter. And so this is this is really where I think a lot of data science oriented people need to focus on is do you have DevOps, right? Can you automatically test your code and deploy it? Once you've got that, then the next step up would be uh, data automation. And this 
really comes into pipelines. So, you know, if imagine telling someone that you are going to buy a dishwasher to put in your house because you want to improve, you know, the speed that you wash dishes, but you have no running water and no sanitation. Like, how could that even work? Right. It, it couldn't work. Right. You, you need to have an ecosystem uh, an infrastructure set up so that the water is sanitized. It comes into your house. The the pipes hook up to the uh, the dishwasher. When when it's done cleaning, the the dirty water goes out into the sewage system and then later gets treated. Right. You, it, you have to have this foundational component where all the data is processed and cleaned in order to go to the next step. And then the next step would be uh, platform automation. And this is one of, one of the things I think that's surprising is that organizations are potentially you know handling things in a way where they're building a lot of the tools themselves and it's like well why are, why are you doing that why are you building all these tools yourself when in reality you can just use a platform tool you're already on the cloud so this is where i think tools like sagemaker in particular for for aws people should be looking at these in fact i know people that work in the autonomous vehicles space and they're using sagemaker and you would think like, oh, well, autonomous vehicle is like the, the high end of AI ML, but they're using the, the off-the-shelf technologies because they're going to be uh, of constantly evolving. They fit with a platform. Once you've got all these things set up, then you can do ML ops. And this is really the, the ML engineering component of, of, of what I would call ML ops. Uh, like, likewise, you know, once you've got something working, you're not done. It's not like you can just stop and say, okay, you know, I did ML ops, great, I can just stop. It's a feedback loop. And so the feedback loop requires you to have some form of, you know, source control, like master branch, staging branch, production branch. You have a build system that is going to test your code, also handle infrastructure as code, do a deployment. And then uh, in the cloud, you have potentially these environments that are mapping directly to what's happening. Uh, you also can provision those environments on the fly and then you're monitoring what's happening. So you're going through, you're checking to make sure that you know your model is predicting correctly, that your software infrastructure is, uh, is correct. All these things uh, are, are huge components of of uh, you know having this feedback loop where you're delivering your model and and adapting to it you know if the data changes for example you know are you going to be able to retrain your model automatically or did you build this like snowflake that was like unique and one time only machine learning model and you can never recreate it so data ops uh, is another huge component of this as well in terms of you know thinking about the period periodic collection of data uh, one of the the key components here is, is if you don't have a data lake, if you don't have some ability to elastically scale storage, disk IO, compute, you're going to have a big problem in terms of doing machine learning. And this is where things like a feature store really start to, to make a lot of sense. Because if you already are on the cloud and you have some kind of automated cleaning, automatic collection, you might as well just put all of the good things that you have to work with, your features, into a, a special location so that then later it's really easy to do machine learning. Like why spend all your time, you know, digging through the, the storage system to try to find some feature when in theory, you could have it all in one spot collected, you know, metadata tells you exactly how good it is for a particular problem. And then you can start to build tools around, you know, training uh, models on that feature store. You could also have big data processing that, potentially builds non-machine learning tools like, you know, business intelligence dashboards. Uh, and then finally, you could also model version as well and keep every time you maybe, maybe every hour you build a new machine learning model and you could just have, you know, those version models stored inside your data lake so you can come back and, um, and process it. So this is what I would call data operations, uh, which is, you know, this, this whole feedback loop around the raw materials that you're gonna need. Noah, can I just ask you a question sure. right there? Because I've heard this before about a feature store not necessarily being used for ML or leveraging it for ML, but also for like BI. Can you go into that a little bit more? 
Yeah. So I would say like with the, the feature store in particular, it, there isn't really any reason to think that a feature store is necessarily that different than any other, you know, thing you would store at a data warehouse. Like in the, the big difference is that once you understand that machine learning requires a few different things, like it requires clean data, it also requires data that has some, you know, signal in it. So, you know, you know that these two columns are correlated to the target, for example. Um, you also could have some metadata around it. So you, you know that these are all things that have to do with some particular domain. And also one of the things that happens in machine learning is that you must have numerical and scale data. You know, in, in the case of machine learning, all machine learning requires numerical data. So if it was in categorical format, for example, you'd have to, to transform it. Uh, so you might as well just do it once, right? And keep it into the feature store. Likewise, majority of machine learning algorithms require some kind of scaling. So you might as well just scale the data so that you don't have, um, you have, you know, it's just a requirement so that, it, that you have uh, accurate techniques. Once you've done all that, it doesn't mean you can only use it for machine learning. I mean, it's already ready for you that maybe you also want to do some business intelligence with it and just literally create a dashboard that says, you know, here are the, here are the, here are the two things that are correlated with people purchasing my product, or, you know, here are the, the, the two most important characteristics of a buyer of basketball tickets or, you know, whatever. So, so you can really have these two different things. One is predictive, and then maybe one is more of like exploratory, right? Where a lot of business intelligence is, is just kind of showing something so that the decision makers and the company can, can take a look. So, uh, yeah, I think that there, there, there's a lot of dual use cases for both a, a feature store in terms of both machine learning in the predictive power, but also just kind of trying to figure things out. Because the other thing about a feature store versus machine learning versus business intelligence is that you may be predicting something, but maybe the thing you're predicting doesn't even matter. So why predict something that doesn't actually add, have any value? Like, you know, I'm going to predict how many how many times someone's going to trip in, a, in an NBA game. It's like, well, that's nice that you could know that, but does that even do anything? Like, can we, is it actionable? Where business intelligence, it doesn't necessarily have to be about proving something. It could just be about informing. So uh, another point here as well that I think is often overlooked and why I would recommend using a, a large platform tool is that with uh, platform automation, it's doing all the heavy lifting for you. And so this is maybe a little bit of a small diagram, but the, the idea here is just to show you that there's a lot of moving pieces in a real world uh, machine learning system. So, you know, in a, in a traditional data science workflow like uh, Jupyter Notebook, you would just pull some data from somewhere and then do some things in your notebook. But in the real world, if we're talking about petabytes of data or terabytes of data or hundreds of terabytes of data, you, you can't do that, right? You need specialized tools. And then behind the scenes, you have to have, first of all, the bottleneck of your storage system has to be solved, right? You, you're, that's a hard limit. You have to have some kind of a storage system that can elastically expand, right? So it's basically the first barrier. Once you've got that, you're not done. You still now need to solve how to train models and, and do things with that with with that data. And so that's where SageMaker will do things like you know spin up a bunch of machines and actually orchestrate it all behind the scenes for you, and maybe do a distributed principal component analysis or a distributed k-means clustering. And then once it does that, you're you're able to go through and and not care about something that's a really hard problem, which is spinning up a bunch of machines, giving them exactly the workload you would like, and then having them go away. And that's what the platform automation does. Likewise, once you're done and you've trained your model, you have to do something with it or else you just wasted a bunch of money for your company. 
And so you need to put it into production. And this, again, is where an endpoint comes into play. So you, know, you have uh, K-means uh, production endpoint that could pick the right cluster for uh, an assignment. Uh, you could have uh, a principal component analysis endpoint. And each of these will require potentially lots of different uh, machines. And these machines here would, would basically also need to elastically scale up and down depending on what capacity. So even in a, in a fairly trivial operation of, let's say, a terabyte of data, maybe you need 20, 30 machines to, to be operating you know, at the same time. I, I think it would be a bad idea unless your, your organization is just you know, on another level in terms of um, you know, distributed computing to build something like this from scratch. Like, why do that? Like, why not just focus on solving the problem, which is putting a machine learning model into production? And that's where these platforms, AWS SageMaker, uh, Azure ML Studio, and then Google Vertex AI come into play is they, they do all this heavy lifting for you. So once you've got that done, then I think the next step here is this feedback loop. And this, I think, is really important to call out here is that the idea is that you first you know, train your model and retrain your model, make sure you get it right. You deploy it and, and you make sure that there's a, a correct version that's associated with it. And then you also have some kind of an audit trail. So you know, you know what is it that went into the model you know, who deployed it, what are the, the other metadata characteristics that we care about, and then you're monitoring it in production. Maybe you notice that the accuracy isn't as good as it should be. You train it, retrain it, and you just constantly go through this feedback loop. And, and, and one of the ways that people are doing this is that they're observing uh, model data drift. Uh, for example, if the data behind the scenes is changed by 20% or 30% since you last trained the model, you could trigger an alert. It could automatically um, kick off another job. You go deploy that into production, maybe uh, only do 10% of the load into production, verify if it works, and then push it to 100%. And then it's just a, a constant evolution where you're, where you're going you know, back and forth and, and ensuring that you're, 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 you're making a real-world um, kind of organic system versus like a, a static, you know, metallic, you know, thing or, or like a, a piece of concrete. Like it's, it's something that has to be, you know, nurtured. Another thing that is really critical that I've seen as well and why I think machine learning platforms are so important is that oftentimes you want to deploy the model to many different locations. So for example, if you're a large company, it's almost impossible that you don't have one or more of these, well, let's say two or more of these, these problems. Like for example, you probably have a mobile app and you probably have two, right? You have Android, you have iOS. You also potentially have people using your API. You also potentially need to deploy your model to, you know, maybe some uh, retail location or to some, you know, maybe a vehicle or some other location. Maybe you also need to deploy it into the web browser. If you look at a product like Google Nest, that would be a good example. Google Nest has all kinds of AI built into it. If you have the cameras, like they can detect people, they can detect sounds, all this stuff. But the Nest client, they've got a JavaScript client, right? Because it's in the web browser, but they also have native mobile, both Android, iOS. They also have Nest that goes to the edge devices, which is their, their um, you know, uh, the, the Nest uh, monitor, like the little, the little screen. So basically, you know, it would be a lot of work to, to go and like, you know, hand bespoke make all of these different locations. Instead, if you have a platform, the platform can build it in a way that you can easily deploy to all of these locations at the same time. And I think this is really a mistake for people to try to build out all these capabilities themselves. Another thing that I think I will be maybe in the minority on, or, or at least maybe not in the minority, but like I have a different perspective is I disagree with uh, Andrew Ng when he says that we were wrong about the fact that we were model centric and now we need to be data centric. I would say 
that's wrong too. There is no binary solution for MLOps. You should be you should be Kaizen centric, which is the problem to solve isn't that oh first we were about models now we're about data. It's the whole ecosystem needs to be developed equally, and you need to monitor the improvement of the entire system. And this is Kaizen. In fact, this methodology was invented in the uh, Japanese automobile industry. And that's why the Japanese automobile industry post-World War II just destroyed the US because they had feedback loops. And the feedback loops were looking at quality and improving them. So likewise with MLOps, of course you need data, right? Like, you know, if you don't have uh, clean data, you can't do anything. Of course you need machine learning models because if you don't have a model, you can't do a prediction. I don't disagree with that, but that's not the whole story. If you don't have DevOps, if you don't have some kind of operational mindset, you're not going to get anywhere. Like you could have a really, really good data, piece of data, plus a really, really good model and never get into production. And then how is that MLOps, right? That's not MLOps. And that's just, that's a very good academic, academic pathway. In order to make it, you know, production, you need to have a DevOps capability so that you can operationalize and, and monitor what's happening and have a feedback loop so that you continuously improve your product. And I think that's not talked about enough with MLOps. And I think part of it is that many academics are experts in modeling, but they know nothing about building production software. And people that are experts in production software already know this, that DevOps is a, a hard requirement. You must have continuous integration, continuous delivery, if you don't have it, you're not a professional organization. Now that's 75% though. The other piece that I think is also not talked about is from a business perspective, you could have all three of these things. You could have great operations, great data, great models, but what if you're building something that predicts the wrong thing? So I, I use the example of the NBA, right? Like, hey, we can predict that how many times someone trips during an NBA game. Do we care? I mean, does does that even do anything? Like, does it help the NBA get you know more customers? Does it sell jerseys? Like, I mean, if it doesn't do anything, you could have the best of everything, but you're not solving a problem people want to be solved. So you you do need people like product managers, you know, CEOs. You need you need people to actually have the ability to interact with everybody else and have this feedback loop so you solve real world problems. So this is what I would call the MLOps rule of 25 is that MLOps isn't just data. It isn't just models. It's a, a collection of all of these methodologies. And that's the, ultimately what MLOps is. Okay. So let's get into the, uh, just a little bit of a code walkthrough here. So I'm going to show this repo here, which is MLOps cookbook. And in particular, this is more of like a toy uh, example repo. It's intentionally a toy repo so that people can understand it. And so I'll just walk through some of the things inside of this repo. You can you could like, for example, just do a Docker pull and you could run this from a Docker container. And the other thing you can do is you can individually look at all these assets. So here's a make file right here. And let's just maybe take a look at these real quick. So we got a, a, a make file. Uh, a lot of people are confused about make files because you're like, hey, why do I care about a make file? You know, and what does it do for me? Really, it's just like a cookbook. And, and you know, imagine if you had to, every single time you were cooking pancakes, omelets, chocolate chip cookies, you had to like, always like, try to remember what your grandma told you or grandpa told you, it would be a pain, right? So that's why they build cookbooks. So you can just look it up real quick and just follow the instructions. That's really what a, a make file does is just collects a bunch of annoying things and, and, and gets them out of the way. Now, the other thing that you should do in your project too is have some kind of package management. The convention in Python is to use requirements.txt. And if you pin it here, it'll make it, so that other people can access your, your code and get the exact version that you are working on. And so there's a very high likelihood that they'll be able to work on your project the way you were working on it maybe two years ago. Also command line tool, I think this is not said enough is that, you know, I would probably 
like to start with a command line tool before I build anything because a command line tool allows me to really quickly, it's like point A to point B, get right into you know, building a, a model here. And, and notice that what I did is I built a library that says from MLOps import predict. And, and that's actually does all the work. And in fact, we can look at this. Let's take a look at this real quick. This library here, uh, I just pulled in some uh, third-party packages that I needed, like scikit-learn, pandas, numpy. I added some logging in here, and then I load the model from disk. Maybe I read a CSV file. I, I added a, a, a Python function here to retrain the model, right? So this uh, goes through, makes sure all the scaling's correct, uh, then goes through and retrains the model and then returns back the model name and the accuracy. I also have some helper uh, functions here that like, you know, take an integer, convert it to a NumPy array. Uh, I, I have a scale function, scale target. I have some code here that goes through and maybe maybe does a little bit of human readable um, tweaking. Uh, and then I have this predict function. And really this is the, the thing that does all the work is I just put in the weight and it gives me back what the height should be. So again, this is like an intentionally simple toy model to just get to the simple things that someone would need to know, which is that I have a function and I pass in a weight and it predicts what the height should be. And so what's nice about that is that if we go back to this command line tool here, look, I can just say from ML lib import predict, right? And so this click command line tool framework then accepts a weight and I just pass the weight through and I go to here and I just call that predict function. So that's really, it's you can, you could, in theory, just in a couple lines of code, just do a prediction uh, with the command line tool. It's nice because it allows you to really quickly iterate on what it is that you're building. Now, also, uh, I put the model in there because it's so tiny and I, and I serialized it out. And then I also built a very small Docker file here. And so the idea with the Docker file is that a Docker container will capture the runtime plus your code. And so what's nice about a Docker container is that I can look at this file and I know every single thing that's in my, my project, right? It's Python uh, with a very small version of Python because it's using the Slim Buster uh, version. Uh, I created a directory. I copied the application file into the directory and then I pip install it. And then um, I then run it via uh, I, I copy everything, including the, the app file into the, the uh, app application directory. And then I expose port 8080 and I run it uh, via this command, python space app.by. And really that's, that's kind of all the things that I would say are probably important. Now, another thing you may want to do is think about this utils.cli file, which I think is an interesting idea is build a command line tool that does you know, tooling for your machine learning model. Like, let's say you wanted to retrain your model and try a bunch of different versions of it. Why not write a command line tool that allows you to change the size or, or put anything else in there you want to change? And then also, again, uh, I could write a command line tool that allows me to uh, maybe connect to my local host version of the, the endpoint, or I could even swap it out. If I change host here, I could swap this out and when I deploy it via AWS App Runner or I deploy it via AWS Lambda or something like that, I could easily go through here and, and make a change. So I would I would recommend just play around with this repo. It's got all the little toys here that are necessary. And then later you could build out your, just go to Kaggle, download some model and just try the same thing I'm doing. Now, I also like to do this, which is uh, I go to, I go to this model here, let's just open this up. And I like to personally build a Jupyter notebook or Colab notebook as like a companion to the production project so that you could see and look into this and, and just kind of understand the thought process for what I was doing. It's not like I just gave you the model so this is the stuff you would do in Kaggle, right? Is you'd build one of these notebooks. Like, hey, why not also just check it into your repo? And then I like to do this style where I have four phases of my project. I have ingestion, exploratory data analysis, 
modeling. And then typically if it's a, if it's a real project for like a customer or, you know, somebody else will have a conclusion that says, you know, here's what I discovered about this project. And, and then what's nice about Colab, look, I can just kind of toggle through these different sections here. But if we go back here, I mean, this doesn't do much. It's just, it, it, it's a very simple project intentionally. I grabbed some data from a baseball uh, data set uh, that has height and weight in their position. I look at the shape uh, of, of the data frame here. I've got 1,034. I see, are there any null values? I see that there is. So I drop one and you can see that just one row that gets dropped. I can then maybe clean the data a little bit, you know, go through here and um, change the column name. So they're a little more, you know, easy to deal with programmatically. And then uh, once I do that, uh, I can go through here and I can, I can look at a description. Uh, so do some descriptive statistics, maybe do some group buys. So, so if somebody was working on this project, and, and, and they had deployed the model to production, they might also want to just look through this notebook and just kind of see like what I was thinking, you know, what's the, you know, what are the different things that we should be aware of when it's in production? You know, is there anything else maybe in the future I'd want to add to the project? So I do think it's important to do this side by side. So again, for you, if you wanted to, to copy this, this style, you could, you could probably just even fork this repo and just swap out the machine learning code, the, the model with your own model and just kind of play around with it. Now notice as well that, that I also uh, went through here and um, showed that there's lots of different things you can do. It's, it's a really boilerplate kind of piece of, of code where I have GitHub Actions that goes through and it does the testing here. I also have a container that's built programmatically, and I'll show that in a second. I also have a Flask app, uh, command line tool, container. And then in terms of the de deployment targets, if you've built your, your model in a kind of container-friendly way that's, that's fairly generic, you can deploy it to tons of different projects like Azure App Services, Google Cloud Run, which is container as a service, Fargate, AWS App Runner, as well as another one. And you can see here some of the different ways that you would get this to run. Like uh, locally, you could just say Python app. Um, if I want to do a prediction, I could run a, a, a prediction script here that would allow me to, um, to make a curl command. So if I go back here, let's take a look at that script, which is predict, I think it's in here. There we go, predict.sh. I usually do something like this where I'll build a, a small little bash command that will allow me to, to um, you know, basically run this from the command line. And I can, I could even turn it into command line tool if I wanted to, where, where I could allow, you know, different ports to be swapped in or, or different URLs or, or whatever. But it's, it's kind of nice to just have like a, like a baked out bash command. That's a curl command that in this case, you can see I do curl dash D and I give a JSON payload. And then I say dash H for content type JSON. And then I just do a post command. So I've got really every raw ingredient here to, to build out machine learning models all, all in this, this spot here. A couple other things that might be interesting to point out if I scroll down here is that if you wanted to run it as a containerized uh, Flask microservice, you could do this. Like you could just say Docker build, Docker image list, and then just do a Docker run and it'll, it'll run. If you want to build this via GitHub Actions and push it to the GitHub container registry, this is how I did it. I just added these steps like, you know, here's my secrets, you know, go ahead and build this and push it. And then what's cool about this is that anybody can now pull this Docker container and just get my machine learning application to run. So if you're working on, for example, open source uh, machine learning projects, this could be really nice as you, you could just be pushing your containerized machine learning application into GitHub, and then other people can just pull your project. They don't even need to know anything about your project. You know, it could just go through and run, uh, which I think is a pretty cool service. And you see here, here's an overview of how that works. Now, um, I think I have a couple other examples here, Flask API, AWS Lambda. Now, the, the Lambda is an interesting one. If we take a look at this, I put this inside of here. So you also could put this into 
uh, AWS Lambda, if you do install this tool called SAM, and you say SAM init, uh, SAM build, and you can also in invoke a JSON payload, and then you can deploy it uh, as well. And so if we go through here, um, let's take a look at this. Yeah, so basically in this particular project, here's the email, hello world. I have a, a payload I created, which I could then invoke from the command line. And then I have a, a small bash script that again, shows me if I wanted to invoke the Lambda function that I had built previously. And then to look at the code itself, we would look inside of here and you could see here that I just tweaked it a little bit. I just say import MLlib. Remember, this is where our, our library really comes in handy because I can use it with lots of different invocations. And then I write a Lambda handler, right? So AWS Lambda requires the Lambda handler. And then I have an event here and I say, you know, basically print out what's happening in the event. If the word body appears, that means it's a JSON payload. Go ahead and load what's coming in. And then if the payload is correct, predict it. So if event and wait is in the payload, so let's make sure that someone passed in a, a valid payload, um, it, then I'll go and I just send that off to the predict function and then it returns back the results of my prediction. So you can really easily build serverless applications as well, again, by just using this ML lib here. And this is a full working example of, notice I put even the model inside of the AWS Lambda here. Now, um, this one as well is interesting as you can also build containerized versions of Lambda if you inherit from their Lambda, Lambda um, base image. And then I just copy this inside of there and then I run this. And so, so you could also kind of do other things inside of here if you wanted to uh, by, by again using their Lambda um, in, base image here. And then in terms of, let's see, what other platforms did I deploy to? Uh, I believe I also, this, by the way, this is the whole, um, the, uh, the process here. So it'll ask you all these questions when you deploy this via AWS SAM. And then um, when it's deployed, you can actually just start playing around with it inside of AWS. And then there's even... Uh, now with Cloud9, the AWS environment for building things like it's I, their IDE, you can even go through here and just pass in uh, to the to the endpoint. Like you can find your Lambda and you can just right click on it and say, okay, you know, pick the predict and then do a post operation and then put in your payload and then you can test it out as well. So so it's a pretty pretty neat little environment here. You could also use Postman, right? That's another tool that you could use to to test your serverless. Uh, the App Runner is one of my favorites as well. That's kind of a new one, and and I think if you're if you want to go like this, the quickest possible route to deploy uh, a machine learning microservice, I think AWS App Runner might be the way to go. And um, you can you can there's a whole video right here that if you want to take a look at at how to do that. So yeah, probably a good time to maybe answer some questions. There was one that was just one came that through just came. Oh, okay. question about sure. deploying with Jupyter with Notebooks Jupyter. with Git, but there's no Docker, no Python package, only requirements and a .pynb. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think that probably you want to have a little more structure than just that uh, in that some of the things I talked about, like, you know, the make file potentially maybe a little bit of documentation about what's happening. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. And I would have to see a little more of what's happening. I think the problem with only Jupiter is that, it's a little bit brutal, I think, for production in that you may be better served in writing some orchestration code, like, for example, with uh, AWS SageMaker. In theory, you could have a notebook and the notebook could, could, could go out, but you may want to just call the API, maybe have the notebook for letting someone walk through it. I just don't know if there's enough 
flexibility with Jupyter to handle all of the use cases by itself. Um, you know, but I think it's an interesting, maybe evolving system where in the future, maybe there will be advancements made to Jupyter. But yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know if I have the exact answer for it. Well, I really like what you did there with the Jupyter Notebook and how you said, just so that others can understand my rationale and what I'm doing and what I'm trying to go for, you added the Jupyter Notebook in there. And you made sure that it's like a breadcrumb that people can follow. Yeah, exactly. Like the the, the idea is that with, with this project in particular, that you're, you're trying to give people as much stuff as possible so they don't get in, in trouble, you know, and they don't get lost. And, and I, and I think that's, that's really the key of a professional is that it's a hundred percent reproducible. It, it, everything that they've done, you know, you can recreate. And so, so another person so, said, yeah, is there app runner? Yeah, I do have a whole app runner, um, well, there's actually nothing to do for App Runner, really. But I have, I have. If you look in GitHub, in my GitHub, I have App Runner. So, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have the exact link for you, but it's inside of the GitHub link here. Um, I think I have like two or three hundred repositories, but it's in there. <laughs> so, yeah, I saw that it is around two hundred and like ninety four repositories, and the the thing that. I also was wondering, maybe we could get into this after we answer this next question is like going into App Runner and just talking a little bit more about why you're bullish on it. But let's answer this question first. Okay. Trying to so, build, so, oh, yeah, trying to build we'll an ML ops pipeline using DVC and CML. Could you please point me to framework so that I can evolve the pipeline with sophistication? Maybe I don't understand all the acronyms. By DVC, you mean distributed version control? Is that yeah, correct? I think it's it's a data version control, and then CML is continuous machine learning. It's both. I think they're both from the same uh, same company, iterative, and so they they work well together. I think they're meant to be used together. Uh, I mean, I would say that. For me, I would lean a little bit more towards something like SageMaker doing the work for me. And then I would call into the API for SageMaker just the way I would probably do things. I, I am actually not familiar with CML uh, itself. That sounds like an interesting concept. Um, I, I'm, 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 I guess I'm a little bit lazy in that I've... I kind of try to focus on whoever's the biggest player and whatever tool they're using. And it's like the tool becomes the the core of my ecosystem. So it's like, who's the biggest company? Oh, AWS. Okay, great. Well, what do you got? Oh, you have SageMaker. Okay, great. What do you do? <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. And if mm-hmm. somebody knocks SageMaker off, okay, great. Who's next? Azure ML Studio. Great. Okay. Wh- what's your tool? AWS ML Studio. Great. I'm going to use whatever methodologies, which could change, you know, monthly or weekly. So that's that's at least the approach I would take is is just literally exactly what they recommend and their best practices and just copy it. It doesn't mean that other approaches aren't really valid and and interesting and potentially could push the leader. That's just the approach I've I, I've taken. Yeah. And we've had a great conversation about this. So if anybody is interested in hearing more about Noah's thoughts on that, we did a whole podcast on it uh, because I think I told you then, and I'll say it again now as a little bit of a, a foreshadowing, it feels like a dystopian future for me if it's just all run by the big cloud vendors. And we'll just leave it at that. Anyone who wants to check out what Noah had to say in uh, rebuttal to that. I'll leave a link to the chat that we had a few months ago. But there's a few more questions coming through. One, is this approach good for batch inference and online inference? Is there any differences in approach you'd suggest? 
Well, I think for it's obviously pretty straightforward for batch using this approach because you could just write a script and it can be a cron job. <laughs> you just you just put the, the the new model out every day, so it would work very well. Um, I think online it depends on what you mean. Like if it's static online, uh, I think it would work well as well. So like if you wanted to train a new model and then put it into a Flask or AWS serverless application and just push it push it out there, I think it'll work really well. It wouldn't work well for streaming online. So if it was something where you had stream data and you wanted to do stream predictions, then you would need to use a service like SageMaker. Um, and I think SageMaker in particular, uh, or in Spark, sorry, Spark would be another one. I think both would be would be would be the ways to do online streaming. But but yeah, for I think for online or batch, they should work. You know, again, this is kind of a toy project, but I think it would work fine in either approach. So you showed us that slide that basically pulls the veil back and shows everything that's going on with AWS and why they're simplifying things a lot. And we don't have to worry about that. And we can worry about actually solving the problem. One big complaint that I've heard about SageMaker is that you're paying top dollar for something that you could just go and get. If you weren't using SageMaker Studio on it, you could get it for a third of the price. Do you have any way that you reconcile that? Is it because they are doing all of this stuff behind the scenes that people don't necessarily think of? I mean, I think that the issue with with large companies like this is that, um, and I don't really have a necessarily a hard preference per se, other than market share for who I would pick in terms of a vendor, but there's just certain problems that are not going to be easily solved by yourself. So for example, are you really doing machine learning if you don't have a data lake? I mean, you know, what, it's like, what are your options here? Like, I, I think it's easy to be like, oh yeah, you know, like we can't, we don't want to use, you know, big companies products, but then it's like, well, where, where, where are you hosting your one petabyte of data? Where does it, where does it live? Oh, in your data center. Okay, great. Well, how how do you actually have um, uh, scalability and reliability for that? You don't. Okay, so you're not doing the same thing. <laughs> like that, that that's the part. No, if you're like Tesla, which I was just at a few weeks ago, they have their own data center, but they're Tesla, right? They, they're one of the most wealthy companies on earth. So I think that's it's just the nature. It'd be like there was that rap song that said, "I wish I was taller." Wish was. A baller. Wish it was. Yeah. I wish know, I had all a, the all the lyric. Yeah. Yeah. I like it's like the same one. thing. It's like it's like wishing and reality are two different things. Like, unfortunately, like I wish the deep learning tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow were the weren't the only two mainstream options because they're both surveillance capital companies. Hmm. And it's like ugh, you know, it's like icky that those <laughs> those are the two tools that people use are from companies that do surveillance capitalism. For right now, unless there comes up with a new technology, I think you have to choose using some cloud provider because the the elasticity problem, there is no easy solution for it. Kubernetes is not like a fix because Kubernetes by itself still requires something underneath the hood has to be able to be scalable. You can't just, hey, I have Kubernetes, I don't need the cloud. It's like, okay, well, where's that running? Where's your compute? Where's your storage? is probably going to be in a cloud somewhere or, or multiple data centers if you're a really rich company like, like Tesla. So it's just unfortunate that that's just the, the way the, the nature of, of machine learning platforms work. Now, the I also think that with open source or more exotic technologies or third-party companies that are smaller, it's not a free lunch either because what happens if that company goes out of business or what if it's an open source technology and something you get you get stuck like you know you 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 now you have to get call a vendor or a support company and now they're the person that's in charge so it's just unfortunate and there isn't a perfect reason or solution for this but you you know let's go back to the bob dylan at the very very beginning <laughs> bob dylan 
turned to Jesus, I think, at one point. I think he's not in, into Jesus anymore, but I don't know. But at one point, he was became a, a evangelical Christian, and he had a really it was a, still a good album called um, Soul Train or, or something like this. And he said that uh, the lyrics were, you know, you're going to have to serve someone. It may be the yeah. devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve someone. <laughs> it's like Bob Dylan said it best: you're going to have to serve somebody. It's either the devil, it's, it's going to be somebody. If it's not the cloud vendor, it may be some open source vendor and they may be worse. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are no easy solutions, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's outrageous to think that you're going to be able to do it all yourself and do it all. In exactly. Time. Yeah, that makes sense. So last one for you. Are you familiar at all with Kubeflow and MLflow? Do you play around with those at all? A little bit. Yeah, I've, I've, I've played a, a little bit around with the 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 um, Kubernetes email stuff. I think it is cool. I mean, I think it's a, a, a cool concept and I'm, I'm definitely into distributed computing in general. Um, and, and I think the combination of something like that plus a cloud vendor is cool. I, I think. Yeah. And so that is actually the question. How do you, how do you mix this in with a SageMaker? in your flow of things? Well, maybe you don't, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe like, so I think, I think with some of these more advanced technologies, um, you know, I think they're more of an investment and it's, and it's like you plant lots of crops in your yard, like some tomatoes, some, you know, squash, whatever. One year they grow well, other years they don't. That's if I was working full-time in a company, I would do that. I'd have a couple crops. You know, I'd have like some stuff invested in SageMaker, have a little bit invested in whatever the new things are and, and just start to play around with them. I don't think they're necessarily oh. integrations, a good work workflow though, for those necessarily. Oh, that, so that's fascinating because it's not saying everything needs to be, it's basically decentralizing the platform and you're advocating for that saying, let's do a little bit of the cube flow ml flow and figure out if that is a nice workflow for xyz use case let's also have a little sage maker over here or whatever it is that we're working on the big cloud vendor and let's you could essentially have all these different types and as you said seeds planted and see what kind of crops grow from yeah. those i imagine yeah. you would need one hell of a platform team to be able to go around and help when things break, or do you do you think that it would be each person has to own their own platform in that sense? I mean, I would it, it, I would probably say that maybe not put those into production, but more treat them as a research project. I do think it would be a mistake to have lots of different technology solutions in production at the same time. In my, earlier in my career, I definitely did that, and I and it didn't work out well. <laughs> so I, I think it's unfortunately the answer that probably people don't want to hear is use boring technology. But if you care about things working, you use boring technology. That doesn't mean you don't also need to have some kind of experimentation working in your company, and maybe some people working on those other projects. But I, I would say if you want something to work. The more people know it, the larger the platform, the more boring it is, is probably going to be the best route. It's very funny you say that. And especially because one of the first guests that we had on the meetup, Flavio, he talked about how he wanted to create a boring summit. And it would be instead of like most of the conferences that you go to where people talk about the new and cutting edge, he wanted to talk about the boring stuff that actually works and have it be this whole conference around boring technology that works and it is not your new cutting edge. So that's that, man. This has been awesome. Thank oh. you so much for coming on here and teaching us a little. If anyone wants to learn from Noah, you can find him all over the place. He's got a YouTube channel. It's uh, practical, no, sorry, Pragmatic AI is what it is. He's also got the book that is practical ml ops he has got the duke course you've got on udacity or udemy sorry coursera. Uh, coursera okay there it is one of those coursera he's got a course 
He's also teaching at universities if you're in the US and you are you just happen to be going by Duke or you're attending Duke University uh, or Northwestern. He is teaching at both of those. Is there anything else that I missed, Noah? I mean, you've got these books, you've got these courses, you've got your YouTube channel. And follow him on LinkedIn because you may have heard this little piece of his ethical side creep into the conversation. He talks a lot about ethics and he talks a lot about career and what you should be thinking about as a as you are planning your career and your career development. So I appreciate your voice in the community. Noah, it is great to have you here. And I thank you for teaching us a little bit today about what you've been up to. Thanks. Yeah. Nice, nice to be here again. And yeah, I'll say the closing thing I'll say is if you're talented and smart, don't work for unethical people. That's my advice. All right. (laughs) There it is. Talk to you later. Okay. That is a great way to finish. We'll end on that. See you later, everybody. Okay. Bye.